awesome. Um, but with that, let me make sure that I can share. I think I'm already sharing my screen, but let me reshare. Okay, great. Um, yes. So then uh, the topic for today, I'm super excited about it's, uh, leveraging volunteer management to advance your nonprofit career. And so um, my name is Gung uh, Wong, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Civic Champs here. And so this is a little background on myself. Um, I went to Michigan State for my undergrad, uh, went to business school, uh, worked in consulting, and then did a lot of other sort of for-profit tech companies, um, including uh, Rent Jungle, and started Civic Champs about uh, five years ago with uh, some of my friends, and I've really enjoyed it, loved it, um, have, you know, working with you all in terms of helping folks with their volunteer management, so that's kind of my passion, um, and today, you know, we have this really cool opportunity because I feel like a lot of times our webinars are about kind of tactically how to help you with your your job, right? Recruiting volunteers, uh, engaging, retaining volunteers, converting volunteers to donors, et cetera, marketing to them. Uh, but today is one of our sessions that's really uh, for you all, hopefully, um, and thinking about your career and how you can leverage your volunteer management experience um, in your sort of nonprofit journey. So with that, I'll sort of introduce our guest for today. Um, it's uh, Arielle from, uh, Glassman from Common Great, and she is going to talk about um, how you can um, leverage your uh, volunteer experience. So, um, but let me turn it over to her and uh, to say a little bit more. Awesome. We will get my screen share going right here. Place current share. Awesome. Thanks, Zoom. And let's go. Okay. So hi, everybody. Uh, as Gung mentioned, I'm Ariel Glassman. I am the founder and CEO of Common Great. Uh, Common Great is a boutique co consulting company for nonprofits. We do development, communications, uh, and technology related to those things. Um, we're in Seattle, Washington. Um, I am a lifelong fundraiser. It's all I've ever done from my first internship uh, in my, I think my senior, after my senior year of college to where I am now. Um, I spent about 10 years in the field as a fundraiser for a variety of different organizations before becoming a consultant. Uh, and I've been a consultant for the past 12 years, um, first working for a regional agency, then on my own. And then I started Common Grade a couple of years ago to bring a broader and more holistic vision about what fundraising can be, including lenses of equity and marketing and digital transformation uh, to small and mid-sized organizations across the country. And in fact, on four continents now, which is really cool. Um, I am a member and have taught workshops for the Association of Fundraising Professionals, which is our uh, industry's professional association, among many other organizations. I love teaching. Super happy to be in front of you today. Um, I went to Stanford, although I haven't gone to grad school. Uh, and I wanted to throw a bone here to my favorite nonprofit organization, Teen Ticks, where I'm a board member, which is in Seattle, uh, but slowly conquering the world uh, with a very specific uh, methodology for youth arts engagement in uh, different cities around the country. And so I um, wanted to give a shout out to Teen Ticks uh, as I, as I uh, spoke to some other nonprofiteers today. So uh, um, a couple of logistics. So you'll get recordings uh, and slides after this. So feel free to just check right in. If you wanna take notes, that's great, but you don't have to. Um, I'm gonna to try to burn through my content in about 30 minutes or so. I just leave plenty of time, spacious time for Q&A um, because I know that's where we really get to the heart of how this information connects for you all and really applies to you. Um, feel free to pop your questions in the chat throughout. Um, and then as we move into the Q&A, um, Gung and the team and I will look at them and, and just try to address as many of them as we can. Um, and I don't know as much about this, but stay till the end because I know that the team has some freebies for you. Um, okay. Before we dive in, um, I just, you know, little, little poll to, to, to see how everybody's doing today and where we're at. So uh, on a scale of one to dog, how are you today? Go ahead and throw your number one through six into the chat. I personally am feeling like a two because I love teaching and I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I'm curious where everybody else is on this fine Thursday. Twos. Yep. Cool. I love seeing those twos and fours. Couple sixes. Not surprised. We're heading into end of year. Busy season. Um, awesome. Lovely. I'm a dog person, so I subject everyone to this slide when I teach. Oh. Okay. So a little bit of insight into what we're going to be talking about today. So first, we're going to talk about what are some of the relevant career paths 
from volunteer management that you could leap towards. Um, we will then talk about how you leverage the existing skills, what you already do as a volunteer manager, um, you know, to transition to other, uh, to other specialties. Um, how do you build relationships in your current role that can help you with that transition? And then how do you talk about and frame and portray the experience you do have to help you leap into that next framework? Um, so that's our basic outline for today. And we will just dive right in. So nonprofit career paths, I just want to kind of explore this. And obviously there's a broad variety out there, but here, here are what I would consider like what we, the sort of standard six. So the first, you know, management and leadership, those are your CEOs, et cetera, finance, and then operations and IT, you know, everything that kind of keeps us humming under the surface. But more importantly, I want to call out program management, development and fundraising and marketing communications, because these four, we're about to dive into sort of what is the skill set uh, in volunteer management that might connect with these other uh, career paths. There's a lot of shared skills and transferable skills in the work you do already, very specifically with program work, development work, and marketing communications work. So we're going to focus on those three as sort of the natural transition points. And it's not to say that a career in volunteer management couldn't help you leapfrog into those other areas. They just naturally inherently share fundamentally sort of less, uh, there's less overlap in what you're already doing, the processes you're managing, the principles you're working from uh, as a volunteer manager. Um, and I will also say that the path to management and leadership is almost always through one of these other three programs development or MARCOMs, most, most commonly programs. Um, so really that one, that one's a product of kind of finding your next leap forward and specializing and then working your way up. Um, so that's that's what we really want to dive into today is programs development and marketing communications and how do you transfer volunteer management experience into those sectors. All right, so let's jump into that, leveraging those existing skills. And I want to call your attention to this graphic, which is if this is your first Civic Champs webinar, it might be the first time you're seeing it. Uh, but if it's not, it's probably not the first time you've seen it. This is actually the Civic Champs sort of diagram of the volunteer management cycle that their software plugs into every step of the way. Um, and it is a very accurate representation of the work of a volunteer manager. And what I wanna name is that when we unpack every step of this cycle, there's something in each one of these steps and each one of these pieces of the cycle that you are already doing that is eminently translatable into one of those other fields um, that you might be interested in moving over into. So we're just gonna kind of take a look at that. And I wanna to articulate to some of the ways in which I see the volunteer management skill set already being able to show up in some of these areas that you wanna to transition to. So the first one is recruitment. And the foundation of recruitment is attracting people willing to do something. That is literally like the heart of development and communications. And depending on what sector you're in, it can also be you know, something that is very valuable in terms of programs. Like we work with a lot of organizations who part of their program work is actually recruiting participants for leadership development programs or things like that. Um, so that recruiting piece, I think, has very strong resonance um, with, uh, with the, the sort of three other career tracks here. And I will say that, um, you know, right now we're working with some clients where you know, th what they look at as, as, as program recruitment is actually very much fundamentally communications um, and involves leveraging a number of communication skills and using communications tools. And so there's, there's a ton of resonance with this core piece of it here. And I think the skills that you use to sort of portray what your volunteer management exper uh, you know, experience inside the organization is like, there's so many things that go into the recruitment cycle. If you thrive in this part, I think there's reason to believe that you can really take that skill set over into these other areas. Oopsies, went backwards instead of forwards. So the second one is onboarding. And the heart of this is equipping people with knowledge and skills. So in general, this is what managers and leaders do. Fundamentally, your volunteer recruitment experience um, is imbuing you with a set of skills and competencies that could be applied almost anywhere in, I would say like desk worker life, nonprofit life, for-profit life, um, so I don't even think that the transferability of this is limited to the nonprofit sector. Um, I think it's very much setting you up to succeed if you want to transition over into the program world. Uh, in many cases, again, program implementation involves involving people, whether they're volunteers or other staff members or program participants with certain knowledge and skills and kind of conveying how they need to move through a situation. Um, that's invaluable experience across the board. And I would say, you know, management and leadership this could show up if you're a leader in fundraising or marketing as well, um, less so at sort of say more the entry level uh, versions of those, those jobs. 
The third is scheduling. Um, and, you know, I sort of interpret this as coordination and logistics management in general. And again, you see this showing up in all three of these different work streams. Um, in, uh, I'm, I personally can speak to my very first job in development was coordination logistics for four big donor events every year for an organization that had an event heavy fundraising function. That also involves some volunteer management. Um, but I, you know, I'm a career fundraiser now, and that is exactly what I got my start doing. Um, and so there's big pieces of this project management, coordination, logistics inside communications. And again, depending on the programs, I think this can be a very strong component of programmatic work as well. Um, so these pieces that seem administrative, they're really part of a shared core at the heart, I think, of all nonprofit work um, that sets you up to be able to take those skills and move forward with them. So the fourth step in that cycle is engaging. And the heart of that is involving and motivating people. And this one, again, it could you could not see more resonance with the development and communications pieces. Now, development and communications are very much um, in uh, putting things out into the universe and asking people and in, to, to involve themselves back in specific ways. Um, they might be asking for different things, but fundamentally that idea of understanding what you think is motivational to someone and for what reason and how you put something in front of them that is effective in getting them to do the thing you want them to do. That is so transferable. Um, and I think if you find yourself really enjoying the engagement aspect of this, you might actually really enjoy development work. Um, I think development and fundraising work gets a gets a hard rap sometimes for being sort of like, ask, 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 your job is to ask for money. When in reality, 90% of the work of fundraising is engaging, motivating, and relating with people, whether it's through digital means or non-digital means. Um, so I think the heart of what fundraising is um, really connects with someone who enjoys this piece of the volunteer managed work for sure. The next one is retention, getting people to continue their involvement. Um, and again, this is one that I think when you look at it from that perspective, fundraising certainly has a huge component to retaining someone's attention. You don't just want them to get one gift. You want them to become a consistent supporter. Just the way you don't want someone to volunteer once, unless they're not super great at it. Um, you want them to have a consistent volunteer presence in your organization. The same things that you use to get someone from, I'm engaged and involved for the first time to, I've been here and doing this for five years. Um, very similar set of skills. Um, and so I think that one shows up there as well. And I think programs too. Um, and in terms of communication, certainly with advocacy organizations, a lot of communications for advocacy and policy focused organizations is all about people getting people to continue their interest in that thing so that they can be part of the movement to shepherd forward whatever it is that that organization does that's aligned with their values. And the final part is report, collecting and analyzing data. This is something that I think, again, very applicable to all three of these other fields. And I will say that it's something that if you enjoy, there are a lot of positions inside things like development and communications and depending on the organization programs, um, this is an area where nonprofits constantly underperform. So if this is something you enjoy, and you can show up and say, I may not have, you know, a ton of communications experience, but I'm willing to learn. And I love the technical back end aspects of this and getting in the weeds with the numbers. Somebody smart is going to want to hire you because they're, you know, especially if they're at the point in their career in this field where they don't want to be managing those kinds of logistics or data and they want to be doing the higher level strategy work. This is one of those hidden gem skills um, that people realize far too late they haven't valued enough. And then they turn around and go, wow, I need someone who loves that work. Um, so this piece about information management, collecting and analyzing and evaluating, uh, and kind of even helping align those evaluative systems to help the experience become better in the next cycle, if that's something you enjoy, um, I would really, I, I think that really sets you up to succeed in crossing over into some of these areas. Um, so that is my take, you know, very specifically on how the things you're already doing as a volunteer manager or somebody working with volunteers um, can very easily translate over into some of these other areas of nonprofit life. So it's not just about those hard skills, though. I will say that after 20 plus years in this field, uh, building relationships is, is critical to succeeding in your career and also inside these roles. So not only is it critical for helping you leapfrog from one thing to the next, but inside the thing you land on, uh, relationship building is, is going to help you succeed. So 
what does that look like? And who should you be thinking about building relationships with in your current role that might be helpful for the future? So the first one is, is a no-brainer. It's your volunteers themselves. And here's why. So a lot of times, I'm sure many of you know this, um, your volunteers are people who have time on their hands to be able to devote to whatever task it is they're doing with you, which means that they are often high-income people who don't have a lot of financial pressure on them necessarily, or they wouldn't be working for free, essentially. And what this leads to is very strong patterns that we see that volunteerism is deeply correlated with giving behaviors, and many volunteers are also donors and also on nonprofit boards. And so if you're thinking about jumping around to your next organization, um, really getting to know your volunteers, having them be able to say, I had a great experience with this person. Who knows what boards they're on, what organizations they give to, where you may encounter them next in the volunteer ecosystem in whatever community you're in. Um, so I think it makes a lot of sense to get to know these folks. And you know, as someone who does a lot of hiring, in, especially in, in development and communications roles, um, I'm always impressed when someone has a volunteer referral or sort of a community leader referral uh, and steps up to the plate and says, this person's willing to speak to how, you know, how effective I was in that role. Um, it really speaks to your relationship building ability. If you can bring someone along like that and have them, have them rooting for you uh, and your next, in your next steps. Um, I think it's key to remember that they will remember how volunteering and the people involved in it made them feel. These are people looking for a gratifying, meaningful, fulfilling experience that is helping them like manifest the human they want to be in the world. When we think about behaviors like giving and volunteering, that's really what's at the heart of it. So people are going to remember uh, the experiences they had inside this kind of container that's about their personal fulfillment. So I think this is this is another sort of opportunity for you all to um, make your mark on somebody in a way that could help propel you to that next piece. Um, and as part of that, make sure you're asking them for feedback and genuinely engaging. Um, I will often say that if you're working with high income, high net worth people who tend to be donors or on a lot of boards, they know what it's like to be sharked uh, and, and to sort of be used as leverage and positionality. And so this whole proposition doesn't work if you're not genuine about your interest in them, et cetera. So this is not just go find a wealthy volunteer and make them your friends so they can be a reference later. It's truly engaging in the heart of it and being able to take those relationships with you because they're genuinely meaningful to you and to them. And I'm guessing that that's probably the case for many of you already. You know, volunteer work can be challenging and nonprofit life is challenging. So you wouldn't be doing this if you weren't already genuinely interested in these kinds of connections and relationships. I will also say another great spot to leverage and kind of get to know volunteers is if you are planning appreciation events, like show up, be in person, be in community with these people. Don't just relate from behind a desk. If your mission has some element of it where you get to have physical, uh, you know, get to share physical space with your volunteers. It's much harder for like national organizations, things like that. But if this is part of your volunteer cycle, I think this is really a place to make sure that you are creating opportunities to build relationships with your volunteers. Um, and I would say, again, invite them, invite them out. Coffee, happy hour, lunch, without pressure, without agenda. Again, these people are often very savvy and they know when they're being used as a stepping stone versus a genuine relationship. Um, so a second one, which might be more surprising is corporate contacts. A lot of organizations work with companies to place their employees as volunteers, whether one-off or on a regular basis inside nonprofits. We know that corporate volunteerism is emerging as the overwhelming and overarching factor in cor corporate giving strategies. Um, there's actually an incredible report that the Nevity put out earlier this year that really highlights how many companies have shifted. Um, so we know that corporate volunteerism is on the rise. That's going to put you in greater, um, you know, with greater exposure to folks who are working at companies. Um, and one of the reasons this is important is, again, if we're thinking about people who can go to bat for you when you're going for your next thing, corporate volunteerism is connected to corporate funding, which means these people are influential. It will look amazing on a resume if you say, I already have great relationships with the people in charge of corporate giving at X, Y, and Z companies. Um, and they are also often looking to create mutually fulfilling partnerships with you. So not only will this strengthen the current work you're doing, it's great positionality to be able to say, yeah, I can jump in with your organization that has a really strong presence of these volunteers because I already know how this company works. I already have relationships there, et cetera. Um, your job can make their job easy. And so if you're thinking about how do I leverage the corporate contacts who are in, in my current world, 
if you think about this reciprocal cycle, both of your jobs can make the other person's job easy and try to engage from that framework. Uh, this is another great spot to also ask for feedback. Corporate contacts have seen a lot of people in your role at different organizations that they interact with. So um, they actually might have great insights into how not only you can continue to improve the work you're doing in your current one, um, but share with you insights that might help strengthen the case that you would make to leap either to your next, you know, move up a rung in volunteer management at a different organization or your current one, or to leap over into one of these different career paths inside nonprofits. Okay. And the third group is the other staff working around you whose work that volunteer management touches. And again, we're sort of focusing on programmatic work, development work, and communications work as the most relevant easy jumps from volunteering uh, because there's a lot of overlap there as we've already explored. Um, but these are also folks who can help you uh, in your journey in other ways. Um, I think when you build good relationships internally, nobody's mad when you leave. They want to help you on the way out. So this is about creating the conditions for the people you work with who have a lot to teach you about what goes on in their world that you can use to get a job in that world. Um, creating good relationships with them so that you're able to take advantage of that when it's time to make the next move. So build rapport with them outside of work tasks. I mean, every organizational culture is different. Every person is different, um, but it helps to be able to um, connect with someone outside of just the silo or the, or the overlapping pieces of the organization that you are in. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, depending on your organization, there may be opportunities to do that, uh, that other people are creating for you and you just have to show up and engage. And it might mean that you have to be proactive as well and sort of seek opportunities to relate with your coworkers or other people uh, in other departments outside of your work life. Um, so there's no, there's no generalized approach there, but you should be doing it. Um, and I think fundamentally you want to get to know the intersection of their work and yours. Um, when I think about transitioning into something like communications or fundraising, um, being able to understand and see what it takes to be excellent and to excel in those roles and having some visibility into what that work really looks like is just going to help you continue to position yourself and also understand if that's really the thing you want to be doing. Um, and when you get to know the intersection of your work that strengthens the current work, as well as helping you build your understanding of what is it that you actually might like to jump to? You might have a sense that You've enjoyed volunteer management, but it doesn't feel like your forever career path, but you also might not be quite clear on what it is that next piece uh, that will really fulfill you and make you spark and is, you know, the tasks are deeply aligned with your strengths. This is a great way to figure that out, is to understand what the jobs of your coworkers are like, especially those who touch volunteer management in some way. Um, you know, you could already be housed in one of these departments. It's a very rare organization that is so intense with its volunteer efforts that it has like a volunteer department. So I'm guessing some of you are kind of housed inside these teams already, probably programs or development. Um, be proactive about getting to know what your teammates are doing around you, et cetera. Oh, did I just draw on the screen somehow? Interesting. Um, so that that's advice I would give for, you know, uh, anyone just looking to do more effective work in their current job. It has the upside of helping prepare you for the next thing as well. Um, and this is another case where really asking for feedback and being genuine about wanting to contribute value back to them, doing your job better, help me help you. Um, these are just things that I think can help you uh, brace the skids a little bit with folks working around you. And if you are siloed, this is a challenge because we know that nonprofit management isn't always super well resourced. And it may be that your organization is really siloed and you don't have a lot of interaction or collaboration with folks who aren't like in the volunteer world advocate for it. Advocate for yourself. Advocate to be put in a position where you can collaborate more um, and therefore have these opportunities to learn and understand uh, these other worlds better in a way that would help you figure out what you want to do next. Okay. So we've covered those career paths. We've talked about leveraging those existing skills. We've talked about building the relationships that can help you transition. And there's one more, and it's how do you talk about this? How do you frame this? Um, in your skills and your resume and your career materials. Because we know um, for better or for worse these days, hiring is, it's a volume game. Many of you I'm sure right now are having experiences where you're sending your resume off into some AI driven keyword search job bank and crossing your fingers that you figured out the right keywords. 
we have limited opportunities to make the case for ourselves. So when somebody's going to spend eight to 10 seconds looking at your resume, how do you make sure it stands out enough immediately so that someone says, aha, they're applying for a comms job, but they don't have a comms role, but I can see dotted all over this, that they've, they clearly understand this work and they've shown that they understand how their skills are transferable. So how do you, how do you do that? What does that look like? Uh, how do you position that volunteer management experience in your job search? So the first one is I would say, use the cover letter to transparently acknowledge the shift, right? If you're applying for a development job and you have no experience in development, people reading the resume are gonna see that and go, why is this person applying for this job? So you have to sort of take ownership of your own story and that transition, acknowledge it and really dig into why you wanna make this transition and why you think it's the right shift for you. And I really hone in on that why, um, because when the going gets tough, the thing that motivates someone, if it's if it's really dug in and centered in their values, they'll they'll stick it out. But when the going gets tough, if you don't have a strong foundation for why you want to be doing this work, um, that's when the bottom can fall out. People leave their jobs and things like that. So I think being very clear, you know that this is a shift. You know there are gaps. Here's why you want to do this and why you think you're the right person. Take ownership of that and be very proactive about telling that story in, in the opportunity that's given to you, which is typically the cover letter. And I would also say that once you get past the stage, if you get to interviews, this is something to be very transparent and self-aware about as well. Don't let someone get, ask you the gotcha question. Well, you don't have any experience for this. Can you explain that? Be proactive, make it part of the way you present yourself at the start of interviews um, and address it head on. So I would also say that when you're thinking about creating your resume and sort of what are those what are those things you need to say that at a glance will catch someone's interest uh, if you're trying trying to transition to one of these other fields, focus on the collaborative pathways in your work that generated the understandings and competencies you have that mean that you are actually a good fit for this next thing, even though you may not have as much experience as other applicants. So I put a couple examples here, one for each area we've been exploring about how you might um, position and write about the work you've done and the collaborations it entails um, that would make sense to the person reading it who is experienced in that field. So with development, for example, we know that there is a strong correlation of volunteers, volunteerism with giving. And so you wanna make sure that a development person looking at your resume knows that you understand that's part of it and that you figured out a way to be part of the process for a volunteer who is also a donor, right? That you've kind of collaborated with development to help move their work forward and you know the game and you know that's part of it. Um, that would be to me a great example of how you might um, not necessarily spin, but um, create an angle on the work that you've done. Um, similarly with comms, right? Let's say that the overlap here is that your volunteer recruitment and management involves a lot of communications with a large group of volunteers, right? Collaborating with communications to develop a volunteer communication schedule aligned with the overall comms and marketing priorities. They're going to want to see that you understand that there's a bigger communications picture here than the world you came from. You understand where it fits in and you kind of understand the way that communications and marketing needs to work with its internal clients inside the organization to communicate to the outside world what it is they need to know. Um, and the third one is example, you know, uh, collaborated with program managers to interpret and analyze volunteer survey data that helps refine future program operations. So that you've created an outcome that's a result of all of these activities and collaborations that is pointing in the direction that we know the, are the goals of whatever job focus you're trying to shift into. Um, so again, these are very specific examples, but this is the way I'd encourage you to frame it. The, if you're trying to do a new thing, the more that someone reading your resume can see that you've been exposed to that thing, that you understand that thing, and you've had experience collaborating to move that thing forward, even though it hasn't been your job to date, that's really going to help you make this transition. Um, and tailor to the career path and its outcomes, right? So you saw some of those, again, here's another um, sort of one-to-one -one for all the different paths we're looking at. This is another reason why I suggest really getting to know the people inside your current organization who do these things. Um, because the more you understand what matters and what the metrics and outcomes that you're looking for in comms or development or programs, that's going to help you sell yourself, right? So saying things like, my work as a volunteer manager helped fundraising retain 
volunteers who are also donors more than other donors and helped you know, ensure that our volunteers were actually giving bigger gifts than most of our other donors. Those things tend to historically be true about volunteers. So knowing that demonstrates understanding and, and seeing where you fit into the process can kind of demonstrate that as well. And I would say something very similar for these other two examples. Um, you know, if you're talking about um, the program piece, you created and implemented a survey that led to this thing that we know is a big part of program management, which is constant refinement and streamlining of the programs for efficiency and effectiveness. Um, and we know that, you know, if you are communications and you're trying to inspire and motivate people, that you know how to understand what's appealing to the audience in question and create something that's going to magnetize them to you. That's the heart of comps. Um, so again, knowing what those paths are, getting a little more insight into the day-to-day -day work and the goals and what their objectives in those areas really are um, can help you take what you do and portray it in a way that really will give you an advantage over someone um, who's walking in with a similar lack of direct experience, but doesn't know how to translate what they've done and show, uh, show that they can, they, they can make the leap. Um, so... The last one is to use the right professional references. So for example, one of the reasons that I, I do think the relationship building aspect of what we've talked about is so important is that um, you are gonna be looking for professional references and it may not be possible to use the ones from your current job who are like colleagues around you if you're having a quiet inquiry. So it may be that this is a great way that once you have a genuine relationship established with an influential volunteer, you should ask them for a reference. But again, that's why I, I spent so much time focused on making sure it's genuine and real and not just sort of like, well, I know I'm going to move on in a year, so I better start racking up the references. That's transparent and it's not going to get you anywhere. Um, but if you're able to, to use a current colleague who can say, I know this person has never done fundraising work before, but their role was adjacent and we were able to collaborate and I could see the potential for it. They understand how to think in this world and what really makes change and how it's effective. And I think you should give them a shot. Coming from someone who already does that work is a lot stronger. Um, and so like maybe your current boss, even if they knew you were looking and were happy and supportive of you, doesn't mean they have the right angle to help you sell yourself to a different career path uh, with someone at a different organization who doesn't know you yet or doesn't know them. Um, so I think this one is key. And I will also remind you at this point to make sure that you notify your reference, that you ask permission to use someone as a reference and that you also let them know that it's coming. Um, I've been surprised by a few surprise reference requests that I didn't know were coming. Um, and sometimes it's challenging to be able to do them in the time the person needs. So I would just always advocate for being super clear with people you want to ha have as your references that they know you want them to do that and that a specific instance of that is coming. And I think that will help um, make sure that they have the time set aside to do it and that they are not surprised or taken aback and that they are therefore positioned to give their very best reference for you uh, for whatever you're seeking next. So that is my content. We're going to land again just on this volunteer management cycle screen. Um, and I will stop sharing. And I know that the Civic Champs team has a little bit more they want to share. And we'll go into Q&A. Yeah. So if you have questions, um, uh, please put those in chat. And then we'll try to circle back to that here uh, in a couple minutes. So give folks a little bit of time to think about uh, what questions you have. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that here in a little bit. Um, in the meantime, just, uh, you know, real quickly, um, in case uh, folks are less uh, familiar with us, right, so Civic Chance, we're a volunteer management platform, uh, try to support folks across the, uh, the full life cycle here of the volunteer management uh, journey. And a couple things that we help folks do are, include, you know, check-in. So this is our mobile app. Um, we have about eight different ways that we do check-ins and hour tracking. Uh, the mobile app is kind of one of the more unique ones, right? We use geofencing uh, to make it really seamless. Um, we also have a kiosk, things like that. Um, and then we also collect uh, feedback from folks, right? And so if you think about the full life cycles, you know, we have applications, you know, calendaring. And so just highlighting a few of the things that, um, that we can help folks with and some of the, uh, you know, maybe screens that set us apart from others. So if you're interested, you know, please feel free to reach out. Um, love to connect and, and, you know, learn more about your volunteer programs. Right? And so this is one of our reporting screens and you can see uh, the data that we, you know, help you collect. Um, well, with that, you know, I'll leave this uh, screen here up for a little bit in terms of staying in touch. Um, but yeah, I sort of want to turn it over to uh, Q&A. And so um, I can get started. Um, I, I, you know, two things that came to mind uh, when I was listening to this presentation was, 
you know, one is, you know, what if I want to stay in volunteer management and I'm not looking to move to uh, development? Um, you know, what is there, are, is this the same advice that you would give, right? If I just want to become, you know, if I'm in a department where there's like five of us and I want to be sort of the head of volunteer management, or uh, maybe I want to move to a different organization, but, uh, you know, that has a bigger volunteer management team, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, they're managing a thousand volunteers, right? And and that's a challenge I want to go and embark on. So, you know, would you say uh, the same advice applies or how, how do you think about that? So um, that's a great question because it's interesting. You did not see volunteer management as one of my six sort of career paths that I laid out in part because not it's not necessarily inherent to every nonprofit mission that you need volunteers and such. Mm -hmm. It's like, a you know, but I, I think there are a number of people who have absolutely made a true career out of volunteer management. And again, it's because they're working in organizations whose programmatic model is so intensive with volunteer work that that organization needs, you know, truly volunteer management that is not just like half of one development coordinator's job or whatnot. Um, so you're absolutely right. There is a career track here. Um, and what I would say is if you want to stay in volunteering, there's a couple things I would do. I would keep your eye and start to understand what are the kinds of organizations, what mission spaces, et cetera, are the kinds of nonprofits that will regularly, reliably, and sustainably need to have professional volunteer management as its own thing, right? And there are some very specific types of organizations and types of yeah. fields that need volunteers more than others. Like you got a future at Habitat and Humanity if you want to do your volunteer management, right? Uh, and that's just one, I think, example that everybody could probably pull out of thin air, uh, but there are many. So number one, get to know the industry, get to know the types of organizations that really need this and figure out how to continue to orient yourself more towards um, them or build relationships with people who already work there, that kind of thing. Um, I would also say, get yourself a mentor. If you're at a smaller mid-sized organization and you're managing a 30, 40 person volunteer team or a hundred, but you have your sights set on a big organization where you're managing people who are all managing their own volunteer programs that have a thousand participants, go talk to someone who does that already and say, I want to learn how to take my skills and what I do and apply it at the scale that you do. What do I need to know? Who do I need to know? So I think mentorship is helpful in any nonprofit career. I certainly have benefited from the mentorship of many awesome other people who I had the chance to work for and with and under um, and who were generous with their time. So um, that is something I can definitely say. Um, and I would also say get... Um, get very facile and skilled with technology tools. We are here because volunteer management can be made better by man by technology tools. And that's why Civic Champs exists. Obviously Civic Champs is not the only one, but if you're going to be making a career out of this, there's, you know, mm -hmm. the more you can show up and say, I know how to use this system, this system, and this system. I understand how they integrate with these other tools. I know how to use them in a productive way. I know why we want to access certain kinds of technology to do this work better. You're going to blow the mind of someone who's desperate for somebody to do that because it's not their strength. Um, so I would say keep up on the technology tools connected to volunteering and make sure that you really know your stuff in that area. Um, yeah, I could probably come up with more, but those are the, the things that came to mind immediately. No, that's awesome. Um, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, I mean, I was I was just thinking when you said habitat, right? That's one of our core sectors that we serve. So if you're interested, you know, if you don't know already, you can you can go on our website or any other what uh, volunteer management software website and just see what industries or uh, clients we serve, and those are probably the ones that have lots of volunteers, right? So, um, I so one other question that I had was, um, you know, obviously Civic Champs, you know, we're a um, a technology company. Right. And you mentioned corporate relationships as well during your presentation. Yeah. And so, you know, I know at times, like even when we're recruiting, we have a lot of candidates that come from the nonprofit space and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm actually interested in, you know, doing something you know, related, but, but, but a little different. Right. And, um, mm -hmm. and you can even uh, uh, common great could even be a different example of like, oh, I want to do consulting instead. Right. But um, yeah. How do you think about, you know, uh, you know, building relationships with corporate? Obviously, that also makes sense. Uh, but is there anything else you would advise if someone's thinking like, oh, I wouldn't it be awesome to work at Civic Champs or Common Great, right? Oh, interesting. I mean, a, a similar piece of advice that would be find someone who's already in that sector who's willing to share insights with you, even if it's a one-off thing. 
um, I think understanding what success looks like and how you get into that thing, no matter where that person came from, it's probably helpful. But more so if you if you see an example of that, someone on LinkedIn who you know used to be a volunteer manager and now you see them and they're, you know, on the marketing team at mm. a volunteer tool, you know, ping them on LinkedIn, you know, and not in that creepy way that we're all getting used to now, where somebody is obviously friending you to then be like, now will you buy my product? Don't do that. Um, but find a way to to figure out uh, access to those folks and be clear about your intentions and see if somebody will be generous with their time for an hour and share insights with you. Um Trying to yeah. think, you know, I haven't worked on the tech company side myself, so I don't know how much more insight I have there. Um, what I will say about consulting is, is consulting is a leap you make or should theoretically be a leap that you make when you've established your bona fides in the topic at mm -hmm. hand. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise someone to say, wow, I've been a volunteer manager. I'm now going to be a communications consultant. Um, that kind of leap is typically not a thing that is very realistic. Um, so think about, um, there's doing the work and then there's consulting on the work. And generally the best consultants come up out of the work that they have, that they know how to do and know really well. And that's, that's where they sort of have business being a consultant. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're credentialed in a way. Yeah. Well, I don't want to be gatekeepy about it. I just, I take the role of consultant very seriously, you know, especially if you're working with nonprofits, every dollar they spend on you or on a tech tool could be spent in 9 million other ways. And so I just, I take that, um, that responsibility uh, very seriously. Right. Yeah, the best. It sounds like the best way to be, uh, you know, from a consulting standpoint, is simply get better at your job, right? And yeah. be great at it, and then you'll yep. be naturally a consultant, right? So yeah. that makes a lot of sense. I, um, I will I guess, say yeah. that the behavior that I exhibited my whole career before I became a consultant that should have been the tip off that I was bent to be a consultant was constantly asking questions about things that everyone else is like oh god do we have to look into that again like if you're if you're the question asker the one who's always like but what about this you would probably be really thrive in a consulting role where our job is to ask questions and get to the bottom of things in a way that like staffs sometime are like please don't make me do that so if your natural inclination is that that could be a tip off that uh enhancing your skills and your abilities in the role you have now could lead to a career in consulting and what you've become so good at that's awesome. That's all. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I know, and I, I, I speak not just for uh, myself, but I know that um, uh, a lot of my uh, uh, founder friends in the nonprofit tech space, right? Most of us recruit from the sector because um, we find that that's, uh, that's usually where the best candidates come from. So um, if you are looking, uh, you know, the, the interest is reciprocal, right? If you will. So, yeah. um, all right. And, and then we got a, a question from uh, Kristen here. Um, so she's from uh, Columbus, uh, manages 500 volunteers at Performing Arts. And I have a hard time putting into words sometimes all the work I do because it is so many things. <laughs> do you have any advice to help better organize and showcase the work experience we have as volunteer managers? Hmm. Hmm. I will say that I can definitely identify with that as someone who came up in fundraising, where there's a lot of misconceptions about what fundraising is and sort of the real variety of things you have to be good at and able to pull it off. Um, so totally hear you on that. Um, <sighs> advice to help better organize and showcase the work experience. Hmm. Part of me wonders what, who's the audience for this? Like, is this sort of in a resume or is mm -hmm. it like, you know, what, like what specific situation are you looking to be better able to convey that in? I think that would help me answer it. Yeah. Well, let's, let's imagine it's a resume and Kristen might, might type something different yeah. as well, but uh, you know, if it was a resume, what would you say? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. We don't put, or the conventionalism is not to put like objectives and things like that at the top of your resume or anything more. But I have often seen resumes that are well set up where it's sort of like they have the header that's the job and how long they were there. And then there's like two sentences that are a narrative that happened before all your bullet points that are very sort of technical and tactical, where you can say, you know, something like uh, managed over 500 volunteers at a performing arts organization in collaboration with, you know, cross-functional collaboration with teams all over the organization on a broad variety of engagement and administrative functions that involve volunteers right and so then you can kind of allude to that um and it's hard in a resume because you don't have you know all the time in the world to tell your story there um but i might suggest something like that i'm always a fan of storytelling in resumes and career materials and not just like the dry bullets um mm. 
because I think we live in an attention economy. And if you are not finding a way to create the summary for someone else, and you are relying on bullet points to generate a summary in someone else's mind that is directional and is kind of shoving their attention where you want it. Um, you need to take the bull by the horns and say, I'm telling you the story. Here it is. I'm not leaving you to interpret it for yourself. Right. And that's, you were talking about the cover letter too, right? Here we go. That, yep. That's kind of the, um, um, yeah, for me, I feel like when I'm looking at these resumes is often around um, if someone can articulate their impact, but also if it can highlight their understanding of the role, like you were saying. So if I'm hiring for a development person and the bullet point talks about dollars and how volunteers led to dollars, right? It's like, oh, this person really gets it. Yeah. Uh, so that that can be helpful too, I feel like. Yeah. I mean, I guess uh, my, my advice writ large is you have many opportunities in the process to take control of the storytelling and wherever you have an opportunity to do that, do it and make sure that that's what you're saying. Yeah. And Barry here has a question. Um, uh, do you have any suggestions on how to move up in your current position? Example, moving up from a manager to a director position. Mm. I mean, I think some of the advice I've given previously is good there. I think the mentorship piece is good. I think also pursuing, um, if you look at say, what does that job require that your current job doesn't? And you can say, aha, I don't have management training and I've never been a manager, but if I want to be a director, I'm going to have three direct reports. And then you go and you pursue like management training for yourself or something that can, you can demonstrate during a hiring process or um, even an internal one that you have, you are interested enough that you've taken the time to invest in growing your skill set for that thing. Um, and I think again, mentorship with sort of the softer uh, more qualitative approach to kind of learning that is getting getting insights from people who've achieved that and saying, looking back, when you were in my job, what do you wish you'd known? What do you wish you'd done? Um, I also think that if you're thinking about internally at your own organization, um, part of that, I think, is being very clear about your intentions. You know, someone in your organization is much more likely to help you on that path. If you can say, you know, I really see myself as a director someday, and I'm committed to figuring out what I need to do to get there. If they don't know that that's your goal, they're not going to help you. Uh, just knowing it doesn't guarantee it. But I think you'd be surprised about how much people um, can organize themselves when someone says, hey, I have this dream for myself. We, we're, if, especially in this field, we're helpers. And I think you'll find that being really open about that intention can help magnetize people to you who want to help you on your journey. Um, that's another reason why great relationships with your coworkers in all these other areas, even if you're trying to move up inside your own career, you know, uh, you know, uh, volunteer management thing versus development or comms or whatever. Um, I think that's still equally applicable. How, um, how far up would you recommend asking for that mentorship? Right. So like, mm. uh, there's the, I'm going to find the person exactly one level up that has the job I want or, or even in a different org. And then there's the, well, let me talk to you in ED, <laughs> right. Uh, whether that's in my or different org, that has a you know two level up perspective of oh yeah here you know I, I went through the path but you know is that overreaching or how do you think about that I mean I think this is where I would sort of be very transparent about your goals for yourself with everyone around you if you think the CEO has something you know to say that could help you but you your boss might be like hey why are you going to talk to the CEO tell your boss and say you know, this is an immediate concern for me, but in the future, I'm really interested in moving in this direction. I think they have valuable insights. Would you mind? Would it be okay if I went and scheduled a conversation with them that isn't really about what we're doing right now, right? Because if someone like that finds out later that you did that and they don't look well on it, I mean, that we hope we don't encounter those managers in this world, but we'll, we'll be realistic. They're out there. Um, um, I think being really... Uh, Assuming you work in an environment where it is safe to be talking about career aspirations other than the one you currently hold. And I just want to reflect that I also know that not all work environments feel safe mm -hmm. to have the, to be explicit about sort of like what I dream for myself in the future. So take this advice with a grain of salt measured against your own internal environment. Um, I would also say, I think skip levels are great because those people have perspective even beyond what you're trying to do. I would also say, look around at the collaborators for that role and how can they help? 
if you want to jump from volunteer or program manager to director, and that ensue, that involves like assuming responsibility for pieces of the budget, go talk to the CFO or finance manager and say, what does someone leading that team need to understand about organizational finances to make sure that we're playing our role in the system and that that piece of the work is really ship shape? And then when it comes time to advocate for yourself to go into a higher role, you can say, I've done my homework and I know that this, this, and this need to happen. And as I moved up the rungs, even though I haven't done this before, I would devote a lot of attention to making sure I really understood and was plugged into the financial management piece of it. Um, and that's not necessarily your boss or your CEO, but it's someone in another team who has insight into the collaborative nature of the work. Um, and that would be another piece of advice I could give. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Um, I don't see any other questions for now, but maybe if something else comes up, we'll, we'll circle back to it. Um, on my end, you know, um, uh, you know, we have a couple upcoming webinars, um, as well. So if you enjoyed this one, um, we have one on the 30th, actually, I think the next two, uh, we're not actually hosting. And so, uh, they're being hosted by, um, our friends at DonorDoc and then another one, uh, with our friends at Memory Fox. Uh, but if you're interested in navigating the volunteer and donor journey, um, or five ways to leverage videos and storytelling along the volunteer journey, um, here's uh, links to register for those webinars. And then we have another one that we are hosting uh, that Patty Gentry uh, from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, uh, Director of Volunteer Engagement, uh, someone that's a little bit uh, more senior on the volunteer, you know, leader, volunteer, uh, you know, step ladder, if you will. Um, it, it's going to be talking about spotting and curbing volunteer burnout, right? Especially as we get into the holiday season, oftentimes we lean pretty heavily into our volunteers. And so uh, just making sure that we don't burn out our volunteers. So um, great. And last but not least, we do ask um, if you have a moment just to leave some feedback uh, whether you, you know, love the session, if there's things that we can improve on, um, we'd love to hear from you. We're always looking to get better. Um, if there are topics that you're like, oh my gosh, this is the best, um, we'll try to bring them back again uh, next year. So, all right. I think with that, uh, the last thing we have is if you are here, uh, we have a little bit of a discount. And so if you book a demo uh, with us, we'll uh, provide a 10% discount off of Civic Champs. So, all right. Um, I don't see any other questions.